Thank you. I have to say it's a great honour to be invited to be here today by the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia and it's a real pleasure to get to meet people who are passionate about ovarian cancer as well. So it's a different audience for me and that's a very, very lovely thing for me, so thank you. I have to do a little bit of a caveat to people who've seen this talk before two weeks ago. I was a bit of a last minute ring in and this is what I had, but I promise you I will try and say at least a few different things so that for those of you who've heard this before, I might try and wake you up for a minute or two. So some of the slides I'm going to skip over a bit because they're things we already know and that might give me more time to dwell on other emerging issues. So I don't need to tell prostate cancer folk here how important prostate cancer is, and I'm sure that people who are interested more in ovarian cancer are aware of this as well, but we really are. I've heard David Smith from the New South Wales Cancer Council say we've got this sort of tsunami of prostate cancer heading our way and we better get ourselves organised. It's a very important issue. If we look at uh, what happens to people when they're diagnosed with prostate cancer, so we're all pretty aware of the physical issues that happen with regards to urinary bowel and sexual function. If people are on adjuvant hormone therapy, we've already heard from Daniel very eloquently earlier about the physical symptoms that can occur with that and the long-term side effects. So even though overall quality of life in a, in a general sense returns to normal for most people, most men pretty quickly, there are some long-term ongoing issues that are very important. In terms of the emotional challenges, a diagnosis of any cancer is a terribly difficult um, time for the person that's diagnosed with cancer and obviously for their family as well. There are differences, however, in the levels of distress that get reported by people with different cancers. So you find that people with lung cancer, 50% of those will have clinical caseness for distress. And if you look at breast cancer, it's probably about 30%. I'm not sure about ovarian cancer. I suspect it's probably similar to breast. But when you look at men with prostate cancer, the actual incidence of what we call caseness is actually relatively low by comparison to those other patient groups but it's still high by comparison to the general community. We've just got a paper uh, under review at the moment where in almost 2,000 men with prostate cancer we've looked at documenting cases for distress and it really doesn't get more, more than 10% uh, even over the longer term. Importantly what that means though is that when you're wanting to deliver psychological support services to people and you want some of those can be very expensive what you want to be able to do is target those high distress people and so what we've been doing in prostate cancer is validating screening instruments, which we've now got very solid data on these 2,000 men about what instruments, what cutoffs we can use so we can reliably try and catch the high distress men as they move through the illness experience and get them some really very targeted and in-depth support. We've got some work that uh, is, is now published looking at what things seem to drive men's distress and it's a surprisingly not that well uh, researched really, which is a surprising thing given what a big deal prostate cancer is. But certainly one of our interesting couple studies, what we found was that male distress was driving partner distress, and partner distress is often actually higher than male distress, and then what was driving male distress was actually masculine self-esteem. So that's new data, hasn't been done before, and it's quite important because it gives us ideas for targets for intervention. Now, despite that low levels of caseness, you know, only about 10% are reporting high levels of distress, what we do know is that men with prostate cancer are telling us they've got unmet needs for psychological support. So even though they're not moving so many of them into that clinical distress, they've still got needs for support and they want those needs to be met. And this is what we need to do working together, researchers and service providers and peer support people, is working out how to do that. We do know that younger men tend to have higher levels of distress and more unmet needs and we need to worry specifically about those men. And what we also know is it appears to be that men with lower levels of education find it harder to use the uh, types of support programs that we have and they probably need some specific sort of tailoring of support. And I had this interesting thought about this when we were hear hearing about personalised medicine earlier and the targeting of medicines to go for the particular mechanisms and for particular people. And in a sense that's what we're trying to do now with psychological to support is to say one size fit all doesn't work for everybody and what we want to do is be working out what are the mechanisms to target and who do we target and what type of intervention suits whom and it differs. 
Now, you'd think we'd know more about this than we do, but a lot of the early work in, in this area has really been done predominantly on breast cancer. Indeed, that trend continues. So prostate cancer has had um, a bit of a poor run in this in the past, and I suspect it's probably the same for ovarian cancer as well, although I don't really know. Uh, there's been a bit of work on this done in the US, but still nowhere near as much has been done on, on breast cancer. But we've got some good emerging work coming in Australia. Some has already been reported. I think Trish was involved in one of those, I think, that had colorectal and prostate cancer. So um, her group's done some work. We've published some work there as well. And I know others su such as Penny Schofield has got work that will be coming out soon. So the body of knowledge is building and that's a really good thing. Uh, and we've, we do know something though about what sort of things do work, which is, which is good. But exercise is probably the thing we know the most about. And so it's very nice to not have to talk about this because Daniel's already done it. But it's just so incredibly impressive, the results that they're getting from Edith Cowan. I'm a huge fan of their work and very interesting, the work we're collaborating together to extend this to sexuality. We've been doing some qualitative work and, and Daniel's group's been doing quantitative work. And I really think this is the way of the future. We've got some recent research that we published showing uh, very good effects for uh, young men with high levels of education, but we weren't able to achieve those very positive gains with men with low levels. We've got a number of very large trials we're writing up at the moment, couples trials, group-based trials, and we're running a big trial at the moment looking at mindfulness interventions in groups for men with advanced prostate cancer. So again, I guess my message there in prostate cancer at least is watch this space. Now I'm going to change tack quite a bit here and I think this is actually quite relevant to this group and might be of interest to the ovarian cancer group as well, is this idea about who is a cancer survivor and how we define a cancer survivor. And this whole idea really came out in the seven, mostly in the 70s with Nixon's war against cancer, which I think was 1971 or 72, where it was we're going to beat cancer, this is a battle and we're going to start to survive cancer. And there started to be a, quite a shift in the way people talking more openly about cancer and using different words to describe cancer. And this is quite important because we're, we're humans, which we have brains that we organize the world around us in a certain way. And the words we use to describe things really influence how we feel and think about them. You can just think about if there's a song that you really like and it's a sad song with really sad words, how do you start to feel when you sing that song? And how do we, how do we talk about the experiences around us? So the use of language in how we talk about cancer is really quite important. The term cancer survivor gets used, you know, and survivorship's the big push and we talk about it all the time. The most commonly used definition is that, that that emerged in America from the National Cancer Survivorship Centre. And their definition is that once you're diagnosed with cancer, any cancer, you're a cancer survivor and you stay a cancer survivor. And that's really been probably the most influential definition of what it, who is a cancer survivor. And then that was extended to include family members and friends, which kind of made means all of us really in the end, I guess, because most of us as we age will have someone in our family who gets prostate, who gets cancer of some sort. But the funny thing is that not everyone with cancer actually thinks about themselves as a cancer survivor. There's not been a lot of work done on this, which I think is quite surprising, but you tend to find in most of the studies done with mixed cancer sites that around half of the people who have cancer will say, I'm a cancer survivor. In, in the US, they have an extra category they use called the cancer conqueror, but that doesn't come out so much in Australia. It's a, I always laugh too when I, when I see that, so I'm glad that some other people laughed as well, the cancer conqueror. But uh, we did a study, a quite big study with men in prostate cancer support groups in Queensland and you'll see there that only 35% uh, actually saw themselves as a cancer survivor, which is pretty interesting because I thought they would probably have a higher endorsement of that um, name given they've already identified with prostate cancer enough that they've joined a group. And when we looked at what predicted whether you saw yourself as a cancer survivor, it seemed to be linked up with feeling committed to the group, having really thought about the cancer and uh, and seeing the cancer in a more positive way and we're doing some more work on this really because we're wanting to explain what's the role of this language in how people adjust to their illness and really ask the question should we be using this term in the blanket way that we are and does it work for everybody I've been doing work in lung cancer if I got five minutes to go was that that face I got eight okay and, uh, you know, we've been working with those groups who have very low endorsement of cancer survivors. So it really is a question that's worth asking. 
I've already said that. So I move on to a project we're doing with the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia right now. It's a small project, but a really interesting one. And it was actually Anthony Lowe's idea that we do this. And then we met with David Sander and we talked it up and decided we would do it. And we're really asking the question about, so if we know that young men have higher levels of distress when they have prostate cancer, what do we mean by young and who is a young man? And I always make the joke, but I mean it, that the older I get, the more my definition of what is young seems to be migrating in my own favour, I must say. <laughs> Absolutely. But we. I know, I love that. I know, I hear those and I get all excited. But uh, we really do need to be clear about who are we talking about because if we're saying that they've got more needs, we've got to do something to help them. Well, just who are we talking about that we want to make these programs for? Because it influences what you do. And if you look in the literature, you'll see I love the top one, late, middle age, young, old, and old, old. So <laughs> It's quite hilarious, really. And some people use 55 years. Studies I've done, we use 65 years as the cutoff based on retirement age. And that then you'll find some support groups that say, we've got a group for, and I think we've got one running, it says this is for young men with prostate cancer and you've got to be under 50. And if you think that's a very small pool because it's about 1.8% of all prostate cancers. So we need to be thinking about this. And interestingly enough, I was involved in a project on this very same topic in breast cancer about 10 years ago, which is why I went and Anthony suggested, I thought, oh yes, I would love to do that with men with prostate cancer. So we've been charging through this and even, I think, was it last week we had our last focus group in, in Victoria. We've run three focus groups with a mixture of health professionals and men with prostate cancer on this and we've interviewed a number of men of different ages. And what's really emerging is that the age cutoff idea does not work on this issue. It's really more about men of a certain age, how they relate to their sense of vitality, uh, being bulletproof and where they exist in the world. So we're analysing this data at the moment and we think it's going to Im be important in helping us look at if these are young men with prostate cancer, what do they look like? And then from that, what do we need to support them best? Again, getting down to that idea of a targeted intervention. So I just want to move tack for a minute and say that it's all very well to do all this stuff, but no one ever reads it, no one ever sees it. What did it matter in the first place? It's, you know, it's kind of irrelevant, really. I guess it's about if you give someone a medicine, you want them to get better. And if we develop an intervention, I want people to be able to get a hold of it. And there's a nice article that was published a couple of years ago uh, in... Uh, and actually, no, I think it was actually only last, last year, an American psychologist that talked about the idea of a disruptive intervention, which I immediately liked the sound of because I'd like to think I could be disruptive if I was given enough red cordial. So <laughs> what do we mean by disruptive interventions? It's all about access. So changing how we do business by reframing our understanding of the problem and possible solutions and to try and meet the needs of as many consumers as we can in an efficient and equitable way. And I really think that as researchers and service providers, we should be having this in the back of our minds all the time when we do something and do something different. So what does that mean? Well, this is where I get to do the shameless plug of my book and say, please get onto the website and buy it and the royalties go to the PCFA, so it's a good thing. But a self-help book is an example of a disruptive intervention. You wouldn't normally think of doing a self-help book on prostate cancer, I meant for prostate cancer, but the question is, if we write it and we do it, will they buy it? And is that a way of extending our reach out? There was a recent study that came out that said that only probably about 16% of people in the US anyway join support groups. It's probably similar here. So for the people who won't go to a support group, how do we get support group type messages out to them? Peer support is an example of a disruptive intervention because it's not a standard way of delivering services. It's the community rising up and taking control. It's potentially highly accessible. So you're all a bit on the disruptive continuum as well. I'm sure you're glad to know about that. So, in conclusion, this is my last slide, and then I'm sure you'll be, Nigel, delighted to hear. <laughs> oh, and that's to say that, I guess, uh, going back to my earlier point about what we need to know is who needs what, when do they need it, and how do they want it delivered. So we want to do a tiered approach that tails in, tailors intervention to need so that uh, we're delivering services that people want and people can use and get benefit from. 
Importantly though, things have to be integrated. We do have a tendency to have things siloed, so there's the stuff people do in hospitals and there's what cancer councils do and then there might be what support groups do. And I don't think they're anywhere near as well linked up as they could or should be. So we really need to work on having those connections working really well, because it may well be that at one point in time, the person who sees the prostate cancer nurse really needs a peer support person most and doesn't need her so much and vice versa could happen. Or it might be that when someone is in the hospital talking to their doctor, what they really need to do is to be referred to a support group. All these different connections need to work much, much better than they already do. And of course, the last point is just to say that in all of this, it, we really have a responsibility to start looking at e-health and social media and all the changes that are happening around us, which I, I'm almost lecturing myself when I say that because I'm just dreadful with those things, but trying to get up with the technology and find ways to use that to improve access and have just more options for men and for women with ovarian cancer and anyone affected by a cancer diagnosis to be able to access that support in a convenient and inexpensive way. So that's really all of my messages for today, but thank you so much for listening. So who's got a question? Uh, now that we've got the opportunity, I'll come straight to the back and oh, look at them all coming up. So fantastic. Uh, Susan, you mentioned the use of terminology in, in prostate cancer. One of the ones that I'm interested in, what mean, uh, how do we define cure of prostate cancer? Mm, you know, that's really more of a question, I think, for a clinician than for me. Although, I mean, I guess it means, are you talking about a medical, so the question is, how do we define cure? So there'll be medical definitions for cure, and the best person to answer that question is a clinician who is experienced in that area and who knows that from the point of view of a person with cancer, how you wish to define that for yourself, I guess, is an individual thing. Um, and you're making up your mind about what's the meaning of this cancer for me as, as I go along. I certainly know people who will say, um, you know, my sister-in-law's just had a double mastectomy last week and her attitude to this is, I'm cured, it's gone. It's not part of my life anymore. But then I know other people who have had similar treatment who goes, who will say, well, I'm kind of aware that it could be there somewhere, but I've come to terms with that and I'm moving forward in my life with an optimistic way. So probably the main message I would say is that how you, is, how you think about your cancer can influence how you respond to it and how you move on with your life. So if you're, if, I think it's important for us to make people aware of that so if they're thinking about their cancer in ways that are unhelpful to them, causing them distress or stopping them from moving on, we can work on ways to help with that. Does anyone have anything to add to that or another question they want to? Everyone's gone quiet. That must have been the big question. Oh, we've got another one over here. We had some over that way, but I'll come over this way first. Oh. Hello again. Hello again. <laughs> um, I was just going to comment on that. Um, I think my father's got um, prostate cancer, and what he says is because he's living with it all the time, he doesn't have a lot of treatment. And because of his age, they said, well, he's not going to die of his prostate cancer, he's going to die of old age because he's already 89. I had cancer, I did get cured. These boys are still living with their cancers in their bodies and are having treatment or not having treatment and that's how I see the difference, mm. is that they've still got it, they're still living with it, they're still dealing with it all the time. And you're saying their cure, it is a mental cure as well as a physical cure because we had to all go through that if we've had cancer. But they live with it if they haven't had the total prostectomies, etc. So they're still living with their cancers. Thanks. Did you want to add to that or just No, I mean, I, I think um, it's really just we're all sort of saying the same thing, really, that, um, you know, you, you get diagnosed with cancer, you make decisions about how you're going to deal with that, and then you construct for yourself what this means to me and how I'm going to think about it. It's a very individual thing, and there's no right or wrong. It's really more, it's, for me, it's more about, is the way I'm approaching this working for me? And am I moving through my life and doing the things that I value and that I want to do? That's the, the critical question, I think, is that last bit. Suzanne, uh, Bill, Bill Richmond. In my time, particularly as an ambassador, 
I noticed two things that was very pertinent, but those people who had or have prostate cancer, and there were very two, clear two camps. There were those that accepted it and those that didn't, and I call it pos positive mental attitude. As an example, I'm now fully cured of cancer. I have had it for six, I had it for six years, I was signed off a year ago, I'm cured. Again, it's the attitude of the person. And one of the big things we can do is not just so much the awareness, which is the first part, the second part is to support people in getting over that situation. And that's where I think the real thing lies, is a positive, positive mental attitude. And I do notice that in so many people, they're cured. Mm. So, the, so the statement there is about a positive mental attitude and what that can do for you. And I guess my comment on that would be that I think a big role for people who are advocates and consumers is to show a positive path through how they live more than anything. And uh, I've certainly, many men I know with prostate cancer who've been role models to me just for the courageous things that they've done and the way that they've moved forward. And so they don't need to tell me about what they're doing because I can see it. Could I add to that too? And, uh, don't Hang on. Oh, you don't? Oh, yeah, you do. Could I just add to that? Could I just add to that? The other two things is in my, in my briefing in the ambassador role, there are two great fears in the younger people and in this order, impotence first, incontinence second, and yet we as ambassadors can now show that they don't have to suffer from those because there are technical cures for that. Again, positive mental attitude. Mm. Thanks, Bill. Um, we had another couple of questions then this way. Thanks, Trish. Thanks, Suzanne. That was terrific. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts about e-health technology and um, online support groups. Mm, mm. And and how they would work for particularly for prostate cancer survivors because they're usually younger and they're back at work and they could access um, these support groups, um, you know, when and when they choose to. Okay, so the question there is about online support groups and e-health applications, and they're two different things, is the first thing I would say. So we're collaborating at the moment with Lee Ritterband from University of Virginia, who's a leader in e-health um, behavioural interventions, where we're looking at taking cognitive behavioural interventions that we've delivered face-to-face -face and using an interactive system to be able to deliver them to people remotely through the web. There's a lot of people doing e-health interventions that are just what we call static information, and you'll find they'll say, oh, I've got this and it's online and when you look at it, it's just static information. So the real, the cutting edge stuff there is not that. It's um, using systems that are automated and that ask questions, feed it in, make decisions, give people alerts, calculate stuff, pick up people who are in trouble, all those sorts of things. And that's where we've got to go with those types of interventions. Online support groups are very interesting and I collaborate with a chap in Philadelphia, Steve Lepore, who's been doing one of the few, I think, RCTs in this area and he's working with the cancer support community over there. Not my particular area of expertise, but certainly Steve has expressed the opinion to me that uh, there's not a lot of research in that area to show how to do them properly and, and how to make sure that they work. So I think that's a real coming area. I have been, we have been having chats ourselves about moving into that environment for peer support. So I think it's an open book right now and one that uh, we need to look at. Uh, obviously it's going to probably work better with younger men, mostly because internet access is just not as strong in the older populations more than anything. But, uh, you know, telephone based a good remote option deliveries as well. We've been running a study with uh, fi about 500 men with prostate cancer. Daniel's an investigator on this project where half of them went into an intervention arm which was tele-based support groups and had quite good participation. So 250 of those guys, we ran 29 tele-based support groups over six months. It was an incredible task and they were all led by two trained peers. So there's all sorts of ways that you, you can do this, and I can certainly see us carrying our learnings from that tele-based support program into an online environment. Probably your big question is who's going to run it and how are you going to make it feasible in the long run? And if you're going to have peer leaders in those groups, how do you train them up and how do you resource them and debrief them and look after them through the process? Cool, thanks. We, yep, one more, or two more, we'll get there and then we'll go there. 
Suzanne, a very nice scarf you have on there, I must say. Very I'm, nice. I'm so glad that you said that because I think I wear it very stylishly. You do indeed. You do indeed. Um, just on the matter of support groups, um, just to clarify for the people in the room, in Australia we've got nearly 150 support groups. Fantastic. But unfortunately we're only getting about 5% of the 20,000 men diagnosed a year in Australia to attend a support group. So that's our challenge, I think. And in the research you're doing, it's actually showing what are those values of being involved with support groups and getting the medical fraternity involved to understand that so they'll refer them. But one of the challenges I think from a psychological point of view is then convincing the men that have got, if you want to call it low grade cancers, that low risk cancers, to actually give something back to other men because they've got through the journey mm -hmm. and they've survived it as you call it to then participate in either peer support groups or involvement so they can actually help other men get through the journey. So that's our challenge and anything more you can do would be grateful for yeah, us. Yeah, so. look, I, so, cause what, so, the, so really the two issues that were raised, one of them is about how do you get good referrals from clinicians to support groups and uh, I could talk for an hour on that topic, been working on it for a long time, but it's quite doable. You know, there's a strategies you have to apply and research can help with that. It's, it's something I've always believed in. You do the research, you show what the benefits are and then you can get the clinicians on side. Um, the second question really is, is a very important one. It's about how do you bring people in to help keep this peer support group movement sustainable? And my, sus my suspicion about that is to just try different models that work. You know, on... Um, What's today? Thursday? Was it Friday? It's Friday. On Wednesday night at the Cancer Council, we had our um, lovely dinner function for our some 30 volunteers who were running those telephone-based peer support groups to thank them for all their work and give them some feedback about the study. And they were, by and large, chaps who have not been involved in support groups. The standard type of support group are now thinking about doing it. So I think if we start to look at different models of support groups so that more men find an option within your movement that works for them, I think that might be the way forward. And we've got one last question, then we have to move on, so, oh, excuse me. Hello, I'm Connie, and I'm, uh, this year's 20 years of my ovarian survivorship. I go back to your question, label, what do you classify as a survivor? And that came to me a couple of years ago, and I have to say my cancer journey has stumped me many times just with the language and the words and the terminology. I think it's really, really important when we're communicating with people like myself diagnosed with the illness, the language is to get the clarification of what something means because what I've also found is that I didn't know that I had to ask a lot of questions. The questions didn't appear. Um, so basically, yeah, um, I have to find another name. I'm in between, in limbo. But in the meantime, I'm an ambassador for ovarian cancer. So I, I'll take that title on. Cancer ambassador. <laughs> well done, Connie, and w well done you. And can I just say that when you do find that other name, I'd really appreciate you letting me know. <laughs> well done you. Fantastic. Um, we have to leave it there so uh, and move on. Please uh, thank Suzanne Chambers. Thank you. Who will be joining us again a bit later on?